In this episode, I will be discussing the technical, financial, and legal issues of becoming a digital nomad. I will do this from multiple perspectives. This That includes someone who just wants to travel around the U.S. for a few months, others that want to travel full-time and become houseless, and finally, those who want to move to another country but still work for someone in the U.S. Cue the music. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast, brought to you by Career Pivot. This podcast is where those of us in the second half of life come together to discuss how to repurpose our careers for the 21st century. Come listen to career experts give you proven strategies, listen to people like you tell their stories on how they repurpose their careers, and finally, get your questions answered. Your host, Mark Miller, has made six career pivots over the last 30 years. He understands this is not about jumping out of the frying pan into a fire, but rather to create a plan where you make clear, actionable steps or pivots to a better future career. Are you ready to repurpose your career? Welcome to episode 289 of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. My name is Mark Miller and I'll be your host every Monday for a discussion on what it's like to repurpose your career. In this episode, I will be discussing the technical, financial, and legal issues of becoming a digital nomad. And I'll do this from multiple perspectives. That includes someone who just wants to travel for a few months, others that want to travel full time and go what we call houseless, and finally those who want to move to another country but still work for someone in the U.S., this is based on a presentation I gave on a webinar for Flex Jobs. I will link to the recording of that webinar in the show notes and we'll have a link to the slides. I spent an additional 20 or so minutes answering questions at the end of the webinar, so you might want to watch that too. This was one of Flex Jobs' most attended webinars this year. I am a recovering engineer, I test everything and always have a plan B. I think you'll find that I've thought of a number of things that can happen to you. This includes losing your smartphone, having your debit card eaten by the ATM machine, or needing access to legal documents when they're unexpectedly asked for. Remember, you are not at home and very possibly having difficulty having things shipped to you in a timely fashion. Stuff happens. However, before we get to the episode, let's have a word from our sponsor, Career Pivot. The Career Pivot membership community is a group of people from all over the U.S. and Canada with diverse backgrounds. This is a community where everyone is there to help everyone else figure out what they want to do in the second half of life and then make it happen. Many have made changes that they did not know existed or was possible when they came to the community. They learn from each other, broaden their horizons on what was really possible. Let's hear what Sarah had to say about being part of the community. So, for example, when I was first exploring the idea of moving into higher ed and I was scheduling informational interviews or just um, networking meetings with people, I decided it would be helpful to have business cards. I was sort of struggling with how to you know, what I should, what kind of verbiage I should use. And it seemed like I needed two different ones and whatever. And I was able to post what I was thinking, you know, my sort of designs on the, on the um, community website and people were uh, gracious enough to give me really helpful feedback. So those kinds of things were really helpful and just sort of kept me moving along. Like, I feel like if I wasn't in the community, I could easily have stalled out at many different points along the way. And so um, it sort of kept my momentum going and kept me hopeful. I'm recruiting new members. If you are interested in learning more about the endeavor, please go to careerpivot.com. Now, on to discussing the technical, financial, and legal issues of becoming a digital nomad. I'm going to present this from three perspectives. One, you got a home, you got a permanent home base, and you just want to go out and travel for a few months and you want to be able to work. The second is going houseless. Notice I said houseless, not homeless. 
but staying mostly in the U.S. This I, I have several friends who have campers, you know, fifth wheel uh, motorhomes, and they've given up their homes and they're living on the road full time and still working. And the third perspective is becoming an expat and living full time outside of the U.S. The first thing you have to, to understand is you are highly dependent on the internet. You may, one of the first things you may do is go find an Airbnb and they say, you'll ask them, how's the internet? And they'll say, oh, it's really high speed. Well, don't believe them. What they think is high speed, you are going to say it's slow. One of the first things you're going to do is get them to actually test it. I use Okla speed test, which is actually, yes, speedtest.net. And you can get the app on all the major app stores uh, for your iPhone or Android phone. And the idea is get them to run it, take a screenshot and send it back to you. And what you're going to see is there are upload speeds and download speeds. People only care about download speeds. Because that's, you know, you're watching YouTube, you're watching Netflix, download speeds, all you really care about. You as digital nomad really care about upload speeds. So one of the things I want you looking at is, um, and in the slide, I've got 88 megabytes download, 24 megabytes upload. And this was on my, my internet connection here at my house in Ahihik. That's more than enough. You don't need 500 megabits per second to, to be able to function as digital nomad. By the way, you need upload and download speeds of at least 500K, 500 kilobits, or half a meg, because that's what you need to basically run a single Zoom call. So first thing, don't believe them when they say they have high-speed internet. The second is... I like to say, always have three plans. So if you're going to go someplace, they're probably going to have some kind of internet service. Uh, for example, in my house, I have iLocks, which is a fiber optic, uh, fiber optic uh, broadband service. It, it does just fine. I pay, uh, you know, I'm promised 60 meg up and down. I don't get 60 meg up and down. I usually get somewhere on between 60 and 100 meg download and 25 to 60 upload, which is more than enough. I also recommend that you get a hotspot. And my friend Steve, he has a, what he does is he has a Verizon hotspot that's a 5G and he travels around the country with his wife who's retired. And he also has a, an iPhone on AT&T. Notice they're on different services. So what I do in my house is I've got uh, I've got my iLock service. I also have a 4G wireless cell, cellular wireless wireless service from Telcel, which is the uh, primary primary carrier here in um, Mexico. And I also have an iPhone with AT and T US. Oh, by the way, I also have an iPhone with Telcel. So I actually have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. And I'll explain why I have two cell phones in a second. Always be prepared to be able, you, wherever you go, particularly the more you travel, I really suggest you go get a, a mobile hotspot. The next thing you're going to need is cloud storage. You're not going to want to be storing things on your computer. The two main players here is Google Drive and Dropbox. I use Dropbox. Now, one of the reasons why the you want to use cloud storage is depending on where you're going to be, uploading and downloading very, very large files can take a very long time. So one of the things I do, like with this podcast, I, once I'm done with this episode, I have an MP3 file. I put it up in Dropbox. I then go to Auphonic.com, which is a audio processing website. And Auphonic will pick it directly out of Dropbox. 
and it'll put it back in Dropbox. Oh, by the way, it'll also send it directly over to Libsyn, my host. So I'm not uploading and downloading the file, which is 50, 60 megabytes. It, if you can avoid uploading and downloading stuff, you're, you're going to make your life a lot easier. The other piece is you're going to want to keep everything up in, up in cloud storage, which will include all of your legal documents. So I have copies of my driver's license, my passport, my, when I had a lease to my uh, uh, house, all my legal, my will, it's all up there and I can easily access it from my phone. So a good example, the one time we were going down to sign a lease and we were at the leasing agent's office and they said, oh, can we have a copy of your, can we make a copy of your passport? Well, I don't carry my passport around with me, but I could get on my phone, grab uh, a links to both my wife's and my passports and email it to them so that they have, have copies of our passports. Easy peasy. And you're going to see other times where you're going to want copies of all kinds of stuff. So, and then the next thing is the other technology issue is cell phones. So I highly recommend you always have two cell phones on two different carriers. If you're moving around, you're going to find that depending on where you're at, one carrier will work better than the other. So when we drive back and forth to Texas, I have both my AT&T phone and my Telcel phone. Telcel, again, is the predominant carrier here in Mexico. I know there are places along our drive where my AT&T phone does not work. I know one of them is right along the border where I stop at the immigration office, and I am very dependent on uh, Google Maps. I don't know what people did before Miss Google and all the other GPS services. You want to be also want to be able to plan for is what happens if one of your phone gets stolen? What happens if you drop the phone in the toilet? And one of the things you need to plan for is how you can get a new phone, but more importantly, how you can get the new SIM if that if say for example the phone got stolen. My biggest problem to date has been when my wife had her phone stolen out of her backpack. It was a real bear getting my um, uh, getting a new SIM from the U.S. to Mexico. AT and T would not send me uh, would not send it directly to it. It sent to the house in Austin where we have our our main address. And then we had our friend Donna, she uh, FedExed it to me here in Mexico. Um, AT&T offered to give me a new phone, and I said no, because the the duty on it would be 100%. So, in other words, customs would charge me out the, they are going to charge me a lot of money. So, I just bought a phone uh, down here. I bought a used phone. The next thing you're going to want is you're going to want a very, very good virtual private network. Obviously, because some of you will be working on public networks, and it's completely obvious that you you're going to want uh, you're going to want that. But one of the things you're going to find is if you're outside the U.S., there are going to be certain sites that you will not be able to reach. My credit union. Uh, I cannot reach without my VPN. Uh, there are other there are other websites that just act real screwy when you're coming from outside the U.S. So a virtual private network allows you to essentially mask your location. The other reason you want it is if you want to watch Netflix or um, Game of Thrones or any of the other um, Amazon Prime, Hulu from outside the U.S., you're going to need a VPN because uh, much of this content is restricted to being viewed within the U.S. borders. So that gives you the main f pieces of the technological things you got to be concerned about. Let's go talk about finance. 
So one of the things I want you to think about is I want you to think about how you're going to access your money. And I have, if you're in the U.S., and let's say you're going to spend part of your time on the East Coast and part of your time on the West Coast, you may very well want to open an account with a, a bank on the East Coast and a bank on the West Coast based on availability of ATM machines. Because uh, you're going to be using probably more cash than you think. If you're outside of the U.S., I can use my, my Amplify credit union card here, and but I will get all kinds of charges. Um, what I do is I have a bank account here in Mexico with Intercam, and I have a bank account in the U.S. at Amplify Credit Union, and I use a product called Wise.com. Wise allows me to transfer money between any country to any country at very, very good exchange rates and very low fees. There are other ways of handling this, but I won't get into those. Uh, besides Wise, there's Zoom, X-O-O-N, uh, which is owned by PayPal. There's Remitly. There's a bunch of them out, out there, uh, but I find Wise is, the, is, is what I prefer. And I know a lot of other people prefer it, and I have no affiliation with them. The other thing you're going to want, most likely if you're going to be a digital nomad, particularly if you're outside the U.S., um, you need to get paid. And I use two different services to get paid, Stripe and PayPal. So why do I use two? Well, my Online community gets paid through Stripe. And when I do Berkman assessments and others, I do through PayPal. Why? Because if one breaks, I have I have the other. I always have a way of collecting money. This is important. So the last thing I want to talk about is the legal. And one of the things that really surprises people is you need to have a U.S. home address. Because people are going, well, but I'm going to go on the road full time. You need a home address. Your bank is going to require a home address. Your bank is probably going to require you to have uh, a U.S. phone number. And there are a number of different ways of, of handling that. Why do you need the U.S. home address? Well, things like where you're going to pay your state income tax. This is one reason why a lot of people move to places like Texas and and uh, and Florida virtually. Where is your driver's license? You still need a driver's license. If you get a car, where are you going to register the car? Health care and health insurance. If you are on Medicare Advantage program or you're on a uh, healthcare.gov uh, Obamacare plan, it's based on your home zip code. So there are ways to be able to get a home address if you have no home address. Uh, one, you can use someone in your family. There are services that will receive your mail. Yes, you can still get snail mail, even when you're on the road. And so rather interesting, I use the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, they have a service that will automatically uh, every morning send me a picture of all mail that comes into the house uh, where we use. It's our friend Donna, who we've known for, I don't know, 45 years. And I get a picture of it. And if, I, if there's something in there that looks interesting, I just simply text Donna and say, could you open up the envelope and take a picture of it and, and text it to me? Uh, I've had two tiny little collection agencies come after me, one for $7. Car sharing service didn't get paid, and I think I know why. The other one was a $40 bill, that uh, medical collection. Because when my wife went in the hospital in 2018, the doctors mailed the bill to the address that we had been at 10 years earlier, and obviously we weren't there. Uh, and they eventually sold it to a collection agency. So you're going to be surprised all the things that still show up. Right now, it's things like my voter registration cards. Uh, I just changed our address because we're going to go back and vote 
in the, in the November elections. Having a home address is really, really critical and choosing it properly. Now, one of the big issues is where are you going to keep your um, car licensed? And one of the things we see down in Mexico and we see it in a lot of other parts of the U.S. is South Dakota license plates. So, Let's say you're traveling across the U.S. and you're from Connecticut and you're spending the whole year out in California and you need to bring your car back to register to get it inspected in Connecticut. Do you really want to do that? One of the things you can do is you can register your car in South Dakota. That car does not ever have to set foot or set its tire on a road in South Dakota. You can get a South Dakota license plate. And you are done. In, in South Dakota, it does not require you to carry any minimum uh, liability insurance. It doesn't require it ever to go into the state. So give you an example. I have a Texas license plated car, which we are going back in October to sell. And I have to take it back once a year to get it inspected and get the registration renewed. And it has to go into the state. The other piece is I have to maintain minimum liability insurance. And people go, well, it's never in, it's, it, you never go back to Texas. And the answer is Texas does not care. In many states, if you cancel your uh, vehicle insurance and you take it outside of the country, by the way, they can pull your license plate and pull your registration which you really don't want to happen. There are a lot of reasons why you're going to want to pick your location where you want to have as your home address very carefully uh, because do you want to pay state income taxes? You know, how are you going to get mail? One of the big issues is what happens when you lose one of your credit cards? How are you going to get a new credit card? When you're on the road, you don't have a mailbox. So figuring that out, it all depends on where you're going and what kind of accommodations you're going to be provided. Will the Airbnb where, where you're going, will they let you receive packages? It gets kind of complicated, but hopefully that gives you a good idea of some of the issues you're going to have. When you're a digital nomad, you are extremely dependent on having reliable access to the internet. You'll need to be flexible and always have a plan B. Therefore, you need two of everything. Two or more ways of accessing the internet. Two banks, two credit cards, two debit cards, two phones. Lastly, picking your home address will be critical. There are services that will give you an address, receive your mail, open your mail, then email the scanned contents. I don't use any of those services, so I'm, I can't recommend any of them, but they are out there and they're easy to find. So take a moment, go to careerpivot.com, sign up for the weekly Career Pivot Insights newsletter, which is sent out every Sunday. You'll get a weekly update on this podcast, white papers, and new blog posts. I just published my latest white paper, Ageism, The Last Acceptable Bias. If you are subscribed to the newsletter, you have already had the opportunity to download it. While there, don't forget to check out the Career Pivot community, which can be found at careerpivot.com slash community. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look for Career Pivot on Facebook and LinkedIn. You'll also find me on Twitter at Career Pivot. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. You will find all the show notes at careerpivot.com slash episode dash 289. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbeam, Overcast, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and lots of other places where podcasts can be found. In fact, this podcast can be found on the Repurpose Your Career podcast channel on YouTube. Hope to see you next Monday for another episode of Repurpose Your Career podcast. <laughs>